Hey, clever listeners, we're closing out 2019 by rebroadcasting some of our favorite episodes of the year. Before we get on with the show, we want to take a moment to thank you. Thank you for listening and for sharing Clever with your friends. It makes us so happy when we see Clever come up in your Instagram stories or you tweet about how you resonated with our interviews. Your support is what keeps this show going. And if you're in the giving spirit, here are a few ways you can help. If you enjoy Clever, please tell your friends about us. Spread the word. Or give us a five-star rating or write a review on iTunes. Or you can mention Clever on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook and tag us at Clever Podcast. In order to bring you this show for free, Clever is reliant on the financial support of sponsors and patrons. So please visit our sponsors links and support us by supporting them. Maybe you know a company who would benefit from advertising with us. Send any potential sponsors our way. And if you're feeling it, you can personally make a donation at cleverpodcast.com. Again, thank you. We love you and appreciate you. And we want you to have a super happy and healthy holiday season. We have exciting things planned for 2020. So stick with us. Now, here's the show. Hey, Jamie, we've got a new sponsor. Oh, yeah. Is it Wacom? No, wait. Wacom. No. Wacom. No, it's Wacom. Pronounced wa, like the Japanese word for harmony, and cum for computer. The Wacom Cintiq 16 Creative Pen Display and accompanying Pro Pen 2 work in perfect harmony to give you the best in precision, control, and ergonomic comfort. For more information, head to Wacom.com. That's W-A-C-O-M dot com. Wacom. Design is about solving problems within boundaries. What does it have to cost to make? What are the limitations technically? Like, I love all those challenges. And then, you know, you have to have boundaries to be able to break through them. Hey, everyone. I'm Amy Devers. I'm Jamie Derringer, and this is Clever. And today we're talking to Google's head of hardware design, Ivy Ross. So yeah, that's what she does now. All those beautiful home speakers with luxe fabric textures and pottery-like forms, that was under her direction. In addition to some other really exciting explorations, which we will talk about. But prior to Google, she's lived many lives. Her first professional life was as a jewelry designer and maker. Always an innovator, she pioneered a way of working with titanium and niobium, and her pieces were acquired into the permanent collections of 10 museums by the time she was 26. She transitioned into the corporate world to be able to keep exploring her creativity. I know, it sounds counterintuitive, but when you hear Ivy tell it, it makes perfect sense. And in her many design leadership roles at different brands like Gap, Swatch, and Mattel, She not only led design teams, she grew new creative culture and devised new systems of collaboration. Now at Google, she's tasked herself and her team with understanding what it feels like to hold Google in your hand. And when we talked, she had just returned from the Milan Furniture Fair where Google had mounted an interactive installation measuring neuroaesthetics, or the effect of your surroundings on your well-being. Very exciting and fascinating stuff. So open your mind and hold on to your hat. We're pretty convinced she's magic. Let's talk to Ivy. My name is Ivy Ross. I currently live in Mill Valley, California, and I make magic. And I like to do it because I make something out of nothing along with others. And you have been doing that your whole life, from what I can tell from the research that I've done. And I love that you describe it as magic. I mean, it just speaks to the wonder that you must bring to it. Jamie and I always like to go way back to zero so that we can kind of understand, get a sense of the foundation or the the soil that sprouted the seed. Can you tell us about your childhood, your hometown, and your family dynamic? Uh, Yes, because I agree. It does all start there. Yeah. Um, my father, Herbert Ross, not the movie producer, but he worked for Raymond Lowy, the famous industrial designer in the 50s, who was very instrumental. I think the Marlboro cigarette package, the Coke bottle. And I grew up 
in a home that was very ahead of its time. My dad designed it like a uh, Frank Lloyd Wright type. I mean, he did every doorknob, every single detail, and it was so ahead of its time that actually Andy Warhol made a movie in it to represent the future. So I grew up in a very unusual family, and my dad was really a visionary. He taught me how to see things beyond what they appear to be. What I mean by that is he would say to me, Ivy, look up at that light fixture. Look at the way it's connected. What can you learn from that connection, and what else could be connected that way. Or we'd be walking, looking at the hubcap of a car. And I actually think that's why I became a metalsmith at first, because he actually was a car designer also and designed the Studebaker Hawk in 1955. And I think he wanted a son first and he got a daughter, but that didn't matter. He took me to all the car shows. And when I was five years old, I was eye level with the hubcaps of the cars while he was looking at uh, the women in mini skirts and go-go boots opening the car doors. I was like, <laughs> I was like fixated in front of eye level with the hubcap. And because he taught me how to investigate things, how they're made, the connections, he almost, when I look back, he taught me how to get into this flow state of creativity at an early age. So I was there getting lost in each hubcap, looking at the different connections. And then he'd pick me up and move me to the next car. I do think he gave me the gift of seeing the world and seeing it beyond what it appears to be. And I'm very grateful for that. I didn't realize that until I think I was in my 20s being interviewed for some magazine. They said, you know, where did you get your sense of creativity from? And I realized it was him. It was him starting at an early age, pointing things out to me and almost exercising that muscle of looking at something, learning from it, and being creative of how it could be applied. Wow. This sounds like the coolest child. Yeah, well, and because he was in, uh, and he had his, he worked for Raymond Lowy, and then he had his own small firm called Creative Designs International. And he, I remember as a kid crawling into his office, he had the most amazing materials. It was a very stimulating environment. And I early on started making things with my hands because I was exposed to all these materials and ideas that I was a real, yeah, maker of. Mm -hmm. And my first thing I made when I was 13, I think, was a, a dress out of chain mail that I made the entire thing with a screwdriver and wore it to a bar mitzvah. <laughs> what? That is so badass. Oh, my God. Please tell me you have a picture. Please I tell me you have, have a picture. picture. I do have oh, a picture. Right. <laughs> I, do we have, get that. I do have a picture. And it's it's crazy because I remember it was this really like very Barbarella looking metal dress. <laughs> yes, and um, totally. And it had like cut out sides. And I had a little square cut out for cleavage, you know, and I was like 13 years old. <laughs> and I come down the staircase and my brother was seven years younger. And my father looks at the dress, doesn't say a word about the fact that it's made of metal. And I had spent, you know, like three months making it with a screwdriver. He just looks at me and says, young lady, go upstairs and fill in that square. So, <laughs> so I went back upstairs with my little screwdriver. And the funny thing is in the picture, you could tell because I, I had to take, you know, metal oxidizes. So I took another piece of the chain mail and filled it in, but you can look at the picture and see that it's slightly a different color. And then I remember I threw my screwdriver in my little handbag and I thought, I'm bringing this thing because in case there's a cute guy at the bar mitzvah, I'm going in the ladies room and taking that square back out. This is such sass. I love everything about it. <laughs> Can you tell me what, like, was your mom in the picture? What kind of feminine energy was in the household? Yeah, you know, she was a violin player and tap dancer, but it was up during the time when women basically gave up what they were doing to support the men in their lives. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's one of the things I remember registering to myself as proud as she was of him. So for example, she would give tours because the house was pretty amazing and everyone that came over, she was so proud. She'd point out every detail that he thought about all of his uh, aesthetics but I did, quite frankly, feel her sadness. Sometimes I would see her looking at weathered newspaper articles with her name, you know, Helen Claire Newberg, first violinist, and being really sad. And I, I could feel that she missed her pretend, you know, what she could have been. And so yeah. I remember the feeling in my body as a little girl, like, I will never let that happen to me. Just, I felt that. 
ironic because I had really wanted to be like my dad. You know, he so inspired me. And I think when it came time to go to college, I told him I wanted to go to Pratt or follow in his footsteps. And he said, you know, Ivy, marry someone rich and be a school teacher and have your summers off. And it was that day when he said that to me that my mother watched the, the, the feeling she could see the fire in my eyes. And in my head, I would never t- I'm like, how dare you rob me of my dreams? I'll show you. And I really do. That motivated me because it was more like, don't ever rob me of my dreams. And he said that out of love, actually, I learned years later, because he didn't want me to have a hard life. He loved me so much that he felt like the easy way would be to marry someone rich and be a school teacher and have your summers off. But as shocking as it was to me, because it burst my bubble, I, you know, when I realized he did it out of love, I understood it. But I'm actually glad he did it because that, that really put a fire in my belly that says, you know, how dare you? You've inspired me. You've shown me this incredible world of possibility and design and creation. And you're telling me not to pursue it. So that's how my career began. <laughs> That is so fascinating. And I think it just speaks to how entrenched our our ideas of society can become, because even your dad, who could watch you and inspire you and teach you how to see things that don't exist and how to envision a world that doesn't exist, he couldn't envision a world where you could be doing what you're doing. And so in order to protect you, he tried to sort of shuttle you into a different direction. Yeah, absolutely. Protection is the right word. Yeah. And that's why I always encourage people to um, find who they are and really bring that to the surface. Because we're always going to be fighting against societal um, norms, right? And creatives, by their very nature, have to. It's our job to disrupt the status quo. Yes. Yes. I didn't realize that until I guess it started with that chainmail dress coming down the stairs. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. What about the rest of your teenage years after the metal dress? Was it just like all downhill from there? Like just crazy, like rebellious, unique creations? Actually, it's it's really interesting because I am on my second marriage, my last marriage, I should say. And it's, it's, <laughs> it's to a man who knew me when I was 17 years old. We reconnected on Facebook after 38 years of not seeing or speaking. And He tells me that he says, oh, my God, Ivy, you were always like you are today. And I said, really? He said, I remember looking out my window. I think he saw me when I was 15 riding a bike with some other guy. And he described, he said, you had this way of like a sense of confidence and knowing who you were. And you were really different than the other kids in the neighborhood. And of course, you you don't you can't see yourself. So I I walk around and, you know, it took me a while to realize that people don't see things the way I do. Or So it's been really fun to listen to him tell me that I was kind of my own unique being. I went to the High School of Art and Design, which was a specialized um, public school for kids from, you know, I grew up in the Bronx, Riverdale. And it was kids from Brooklyn, Queens, Manhattan, the Bronx, who created a portfolio to get into the High School of Art and Design that was very much for kids who, you know, instead of the football club, we had the art club. And it was taught by people who, teachers who were in their field already. You know, advertising classes were taught, taught by people who were in the advertising field. So it was, it was a pretty unusual high school. And so that just continued to exercise my creative muscle. And I guess when I would come off the bus from you know, New York City every day, I just stayed myself. And where I grew up, there was all the best private schools, Fieldston, um, Ethical Culture, Riverdale Country School. But I would go off to this incredible creative haven and come back. And as Arthur will say, you know, be fully myself, which I don't know what that meant, because it's all I know how to be. Well, that's really wonderful, because a lot of people... I guess maybe we're a little bit more susceptible to social norms and had to struggle to find themselves. Yeah. And I guess I'm grateful for it because it made me feel confident in what I do well. I love to do it. I'm thinking if 
you know, your dad had told you to marry someone rich and go be a school teacher, it could have had two responses, right? You could have thought, oh, okay, well, he knows more than I do. Maybe I really should follow that path. I should at least give it some thought and try it. Or... F that, Dad. Like, <laughs> I'm, you know, and <laughs> you were so confident in yourself and your dreams that you just knew, even though you didn't know what was going to happen, you knew you needed to go in that direction. Exactly. Like, I, you know, success was never, in fact, people always used to say to me, you know, what's your five year plan? I never have a five year plan. I'm very intuitive. I, I think life is a board game and I'm here to try everything at least once. And I, feel into when things feel like I'm ready for the next challenge. So I never have a five-year plan. And it wasn't about success. I mean, the irony is I just knew I needed to act out who I was. Yeah, that was really the goal and live a life of no regrets. I think when I think about it, I feel very fortunate. When I was in my 20s, I think I had a bit of an out-of-body experience and I felt what it feels like to be not in your body. And it's an incredible sea of unconditional love. But I realized when I came back into my body that when we are embodied, we are here to live this life. And actually, when we can touch and feel and sense, and that's probably why my aesthetic comes a little bit from that, because I have such a great appreciation for what it means to be human (laughs) and to be able to um, see and touch and feel. I'm starting to get a sense now that, yeah, you have a real appreciation of of the senses because you've also have the experience of that perspective of being away from the senses. So you kind of get what they're about. Correct. So I I am so grateful. I was, you know, I think everything happens for a reason and you don't know often when it's happening until you kind of look back and then, my whole life has been like that. I've looked back, I've gone on my intuition, but then I look back and I go, wow, that happened to allow me to, you know, do this and on and on. And so you're absolutely right. I realized that happened to me to further amplify my appreciation of the senses. During the college years, I know that you studied art and psychology and and eventually jewelry design. And to me, that seems logical based on what you've already told us about your life. It's a triad of creative thinking and visionary stuff, plus the physical execution and expression of making and the senses, and also the study of the human behaviors and motivations. I'm also drawing the conclusion that hubcaps are the jewelry of cars. Correct. No, that's a very good analogy. You're absolutely right. I think yeah, I think that absolutely had an effect on me, uh, the way it's connected. It had a function. You know, I think jewelry is one of the early, I, I realize now, they say it's even earlier than cave paintings. It was the way that people adorned or expressed themselves is through, through jewelry. But, you know, my dad taught me an important piece is when I went to art school, you know, if you're an artist, you, you take a piece of your soul and put it on a pedestal and hope that someone comes by and resonates with it. He taught me that a designer actually solves people's problems and watches millions of people enjoy the solution. And because when I went to art school, you know, there was a little bit of a push on, oh, you know, designers, you play into the market and artists get to express themselves. But he inspired me differently. I started as an artist and did one-of-a-kind pieces of jewelry, and my work is in 10 museums around the world. That was really because I'm a very curious person. He taught me how to be curious in terms Mm -hmm. of why does this work this way? How is this attached? And kind of be relentless in the inquisition. And so being a metalsmith uh, in the studio, I would have questions around, wow, I wonder if I cut back through this oxide layer of metal, what would happen? And I would spend, you know, three nights in a row up in the studio, like the mad scientist coming at the problem from many different ways until I could create a solution and therefore created some unique techniques using metals called titanium and niobium that ended up in museums. But it was a very lonely working as an artist, quote unquote, or one of a kind pieces. It was an incredible gift 
um, that I don't regret because I think when you have an idea and you manifest it with your own hands, that's a really important piece. But I realized I loved people and it was kind of a lonely to be in the, in the studio by yourself. And I had always been interested in psychology, specifically Jungian psychology. And when my dad died, I would get all these dreams and I wanted to understand what the images were. So I went and took a 10-day intensive class at the Jungian Institute. So I'm someone that is a lifelong learner. Like if I have a question or don't understand something, I will deep dive and spend my time learning it. But he really inspired me to be a designer and solve big problems. I also remember he was a pioneer, believe it or not, in supermarket design in that he realize that supermarkets, you don't have to come in and just get milk and eggs and leave. If we made it a more beautiful aesthetic place and offered other things, people would stay longer. So I actually remember models he did in the basement of the early concepts of the food emporium, you know, places where people would buy wine and do other things. And he had imported a, a gentleman from Germany who was the first man to understand watching how, why people make the decisions they make, meaning he would put things on supermarket aisles that would track why people pulled certain things off the shelf. So as a kid, I became very fascinated with the psychology of the emotional connection between objects and why do people resonate with certain things. And I think that played into my interest in wanting to kind of the juxtaposition between making things from nothing, but making sure that they delighted and surprised people and actually people connected to these objects. And it sounds to me too, like achieving the status and being in the collection of 10 museums is fantastic. And it's a validation of your creativity and your expression, but it's also a bit rarefied and removed it's it's not on a person when it's in a museum collection. So you're not developing that long-term relationship with a human through the artwork. I mean, I've always felt like my work is an extension of myself, and I want it to be in someone's home, learning them, feeling their body, like, <laughs> not in a creepy way, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, and you know, the weird thing is, well, first of all, the greatest gift that that actually gave me when I look back having gotten my work in my early 20s in museums was the gift of understanding that the ego, you know, there's some people, and I don't want to make light of it, who, you know, their whole life have a goal like, oh, if only my work could get into a museum. And mm -hmm. the truth is the high lasted for me for about two weeks. You know, sure, I had a little ego kick. And then, yeah. life, and then life was back to normal. And I realized that life is about the journey. It's not about the end game. And that gift of understanding that at like 24 years old was the best gift that could have ever been given to me. So that's why I feel that happened to me was to give me that understanding early on that life is about the journey and the adventure, not the end game. Because that's changed, I believe, the way I have proceeded with my career. I do agree with you. It's a little creepy. By accident, I was in the Victoria and Albert Museum, and I've never seen my work in a museum before. And my husband and I stumbled on it by accident. And it was almost creepy to see those cards. You know how they have, like, when you're when the artist is born and then when they died? And I looked, uh -huh. to, and I looked to my left because it was the whole history of jewelry design. And, like, everyone else had, a you know, the people that came before me to my left all had the the two dates, and mine was just left blank. And, you know, for the, and I, I said to my husband, I said, let's, let's get out of here. Cause it was, it was almost bizarre to be looking at it. So I know what you mean, but I don't, I believe it was about the gift of understanding the journey. Yeah. What a tremendous gift. Most people take a lot longer to learn that. And they spend endless years striving for something that ultimately doesn't fulfill them. Yep. And then they get about getting on with it. But it sounds like you got to start doing that a lot younger. Yes. And I'm very thankful for that. And that was actually, to me, what came out of that period of time. Yeah, it sounds like that was the most important thing you learned from being a jewelry designer and maker that this whole journey that you could eventually be on, or that you are currently on, <laughs> is the most exciting thing. So it must have set the stage for your next chapter. 
Stay tuned for more after these messages. Support for Clever comes from Sunski. Have you ever had an expensive pair of sunglasses so uncomfortable they made your face hurt? Or a cheap pair that broke right away? Yeah, us too. The folks at Sunski feel your pain. They believe good design can solve these problems and be sustainable too. Sunski's polarized shades are designed for stylish adventure. They're strong, comfortable, and made from recycled plastic, all for a fair price. We know because we tried them out. Sunski cares about what we put on our faces, and so should you. See Sunski's Red Dot award-winning shades and save 10% using code CLEVER at sunski.com slash clever. That's S-U-N-S-K-I dot com slash clever. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, what happened after you learned that important lesson? I worked for, I won't name the firm, but a young firm. Three days a week, I was a designer for them. I think I was the first designer they employed. And the other two days a week, I had a a studio in the West Village, still making my own pieces because I wanted to keep up the art of making. So I was always fairly intuitive as a kid. And I would, because I really loved people, I would watch people, I'd read everything. And I always had a sense of what was coming next, what society would be craving. And I would do designs that were what I thought was coming next. And I would show it to my boss. And this was my first job out of school. And she would say to me, oh, Ivy, that's lovely. But here, make something like this. And she had bought some pieces that were already successful selling in department stores and basically wanted me to be inspired by these things that were already out on the market and to do variations on that. (laughs) So I... Um, my first job. And I thought, wow, is this what creativity is? But I did what she asked me to. And I did variations on a theme. It's like corporate inbreeding. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, but the story gets better. So what happens is, so the two days a week, I'm in my studio doing my own thing. And I'm walking through Bergdorf Goodman one day, I'm like 26 now, I think maybe 27. And I'm wearing some of the pieces I made in my studio, which I did on my own time. And this woman comes up to me and says, oh, my God, those pins are amazing. Where did you get them? And I said, I made them. And she said, what's the name of your company? I didn't have a company. I looked down, and they were kind of small and kind of wonderful. And I said, small wonders. And she said, well, come back to my office, young lady. And she wrote me a purchase order for $60,000 worth of these little pins. Holy shit! Yeah, yeah. And I didn't even (laughs) own the name Small Wonders. I just made it up because I thought, whoa. And I thought, and and these were things that I had, you know, felt was really the way people were going to wear jewelry in the future. So she writes this purchase order to Small Wonders. Of course, I go to the first women's bank to get a loan and they go, where's your, where's your car? Where's your house? And I had nothing to leverage. So I ended up borrowing the money, took about $30,000 I needed to buy materials to make the $60,000 worth of product. And so I ended up borrowing from old boyfriends and relatives, which you should never do because... They want to have lunch with you every week to see how their investment's going. (laughs) Um, Anyway, fast forward, about 30 days later, I deliver the goods, and they go into Bergdorf Goodman under a case called Small Wonders, not with my name. And I'm back, you know, I'm at my full-time, I'm at my three-day-week design job. And my boss at the time comes, like she always does, she always brings me other people's things to be inspired by. She says, oh my God, Ivy, there's there's this new company, Small Wonders. They're doing the coolest (laughs) stuff. And she puts it in front of me and I stand up and I go, I am Small Wonders and I quit. (laughs) So um, when I, so to me, that was like a great way to start my career. I was thrown into it. You know, this idea that sometimes people, instead of being, you know, that you have to be validated by someone else's work versus having the foresight to say, we're going to be bold and take a chance. And the fact that Mm -hmm. she had to buy my own work and show it to me um, because it had been validated by the department store versus, I mean, these are the kinds of things I would have happily have been doing for the company, but 
they preferred to go the safe route. So I think, again, that was something that was a great learning for me that gave me a sense of confidence that said, you know what you're doing. You do know what you're doing. And, you know, you should follow your instincts. And so that kind of propelled me into my career. And I eventually got a partner in Small Wonders. And the two of us had that company for, I think it was three or four years, selling to a number of department stores, jewelry design, where we would come up with the idea and then hit the streets and find manufacturers to make it because it was much more high volume. But what I really loved to do was, depending on where society was going, whether I felt the jewelry should be out of fabric or gold or brass, I didn't want to be married to one material because it was really about the idea, the concept. And Mm -hmm. eventually, because of the volumes, we would have had to commit to a factory, one modality, you know, are you a golden diamond house? Are you brass? Are you making things of plastic? And for me, that took all the creativity out because I know then I would be a slave to optimizing for that factory or that equipment. So that's when I went into, the phone was ringing off the hook because we were winning all kinds of, I mean, Small Wonders was picked by Vogue magazine as one of the most, 10 most important accessory companies this was back in the, uh, let me think, 70s, late 70s, early 80s. I was getting a ton of calls saying, you know, would you come inside and design for us? And I had never thought of that. But once I realized I wanted to remain creative and not be a slave to one factory or modality, I thought, you know what? Yeah, let me go inside a company and see how um, what that would feel like. So that's when I ventured on entering the corporate world, designing everything from swatch watches to coach. I was a president of Calvin Klein, Mattel Toys. I mean, I basically quickly got a team because I was someone who really spent the time to understand the gifts and talents of someone and really respected that and would figure out how to leverage the members of my team to do their best work so that we could create together. I was told I had this unique knack for bringing out, you know, the best in people, which made me really happy because it wasn't about me anymore. For me, the joy was what I say today, which is I'm an orchestra conductor and (laughs) My job is to know all of my instruments really well and for us to kind of co-create a piece of music. And my job is to hold that vision and be the conductor to, to realize that dream. And that's what I get to do all the time. This is such a fascinating story because it also sounds like your experience, that first corporate experience where... They couldn't validate your work from their own perspective. They needed Bergdorf Goodman to validate it. Then they knew they wanted it. By the time you went back to the corporate world, you had already figured out that that goes on and that you're not going to be a party to that kind of creative stifling. You trusted your vision for what was going to happen and that other people have this vision too and that your real gift is helping bring forth everyone's talent. Yes. Yes. No, you're absolutely right. That's why I say I look back and I wonder, I I can really see the dots of these events that happened and how they led to me becoming who I am or what I love to do. And and I am very grateful every day for all of these sequence of events because I realized they set me up to do and be who I was. And so for me, I walked into the corporate world with confidence and was quite frankly pretty surprised at how they thought creativity actually happened. You know, because people in those days were in like gray boxes. And I was like, wow, you know, I'd come in there with like a little cocker spaniel with my head cocked going, really? Is that really how you think it works? And, <laughs> and so I then became kind of an innovation expert of creating new ways of working together in creative departments to to get the best out of people 
because I understood, I thought, and, and what I haven't mentioned is I won somewhere along there, I forget the timing, I won the De Beers Diamond Competition, World Diamond Competition. I, I won a lot of honors and competitions. And I, I would say to myself, wow, when I, am the, when I was the most creative doing that for me, like how do I give that gift to others? And I would watch you know, companies hire consulting companies and say they needed to reinvent the product development process. And oftentimes they did, but then they would roll out how it should operate. And I would look at that and go, wow, that's how a car works. It's not the way humans work. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. so I really was inspired to figure out how do I give this gift that I had for myself when I was my most creative to others, or how do I set up the environment for them to work and be their best? And and I realize now that that was kind of also using my psychology or understanding of people. And so in the 90s, I think it was, yeah, I won the Chairman's Award for Sustainability of the whole company of Mattel Toys for something I developed called Project Platypus, which was really a new way of creating uh, product ideas that leveraged everything I knew to be true because I should mention that simultaneously while I was growing, you know, my career from one company to another. And by the way, some people looked at my resume and said, I don't understand. Are you a toy designer? Are you a shoe designer? Are you a clothing? You know what? I said, I'm a builder. And I, and that is the consistent, you know, I'm a builder of something from nothing and it could be a brand. It could be uh, a product it could be, I had my own, I had a retail store um, with two partners also in the 80s. So it's really this idea of having a vision and working with people to create something from nothing. I mean, that's what I did. And it, for me, it's very important that people are doing uh, what they're meant to do and that mm-hmm. I can create an environment that sets them up to leverage that. I remember when I first entered the corporate world, you know, HR would say to me, well, here's what, you know, your people, here's what they do well, and here's what they don't do well. And you've got to work with them on what they don't do well. And I remember saying, well, why, why wouldn't we just give them the opportunity to do more of what they do well? And they kind of looked at me like, huh? And sometimes I do think that, that if you can see a particular gift with someone, that putting them in a box is not the right thing to do. It's how do you leverage what they do well. So I think it was in my 40s, early 40s, I realized, because I never set out to be, at that point, I think I was a senior vice president. I had been a president. I mean, I didn't care what you called me because it, it, was it wasn't about goals. It was every job I took was about what am I going to learn that I haven't already learned and are they going to use me for what I do best? Because I do mm-hmm. believe that has to be reciprocal. And so that's how I made my moves. But I realized one day, wow, I didn't set out to be a senior vice president. Why, why did that happen? And I realized it was to gain credibility to do the real work. And when I say the real work, it was maybe setting a different tone for how we can create together. So at the time I was taking a lot of the, any extra money I had from the corporate world and using it to continue my curiosity. I've studied for 30 years, sound and vibration and wellness and color and light and all these things. I was doing sound baths 40 years ago um, when people were like, what are you doing? And I um, was studying the effects of sound on health. And so I, and I continued studies in, um, let's see, Jungian psychology in something called biogeometry, which is the effects that different shapes have on energy. And I, with Project Platypus at Mattel, created a way where I would bring people together. So I'll give you an example, probably one of the more outrageous examples. And this was Mm -hmm. about 20 years ago. I realized I'd watch, you know, we talk about brainstorming and that sometimes you have three people that start out to brainstorm and after an hour, nothing happens. And then other times you have three people that, oh my God, great ideas happen. And I say, well, you know, actually those three people are on the same wavelength and these three people are not. And I said to myself, I wonder if I could force people to be on the same wavelength because if they could start out at that place, they could spiral together to new ideas a lot quicker. 
And so at the time I asked one of my sound teachers, a Dr. Jeff Thompson, you know, could we force people, could we find the fundamental frequency at which people resonate and actually have them start at that place and therefore be more productive together? Uh, sure enough, he said, okay, Ivy. And he, we did this master experiment with 12 of my designers, finding the fundamental frequency at which they resonated, embedded that in music. And whenever we would create in the studio, I would play that music in the background and the concept of entrainment, which is, you know, when cuckoo clocks swing and they all of a sudden start swinging together, Mm -hmm. you, you all tend to go to the same place. So we would get on the same wavelength and the things we would create would be award-winning toys. So that's just a small example. There's a lot many others that went into this program, but it was when I became really super brave and said, I have the credibility. I think I had about 300 people working for me at the time. I said, I can create a different way for us to work. And that that's when I won the chairman's award. And so for me, life is not interesting if I'm not constantly challenging, reinventing, uh, creating, and not by myself, but doing it together and watching the joy that happens when we achieve things as a group. Well, I mean, you talked about yourself being an orchestra conductor earlier, and it's it's one thing to play the flute beautifully. It's another thing to organize all of these different creatives to make this glorious swell of music with a crescendo and decrescendo and resonating with your emotions. And when you when you can direct a team like that, you can have such an impact. And and I love solving problems. So in design, I mean, you've got to dance well with engineers. You've got to, it's a constant dance of challenges, trade-offs, making decisions, deciding what you, you know, what you stand up for, what you back off on. So I love the entire process because it's, it's really, you know, design is about solving problems within boundaries. So the boundaries of what does it have to cost to make? What are the limitations technically? Like, I love all those challenges. And then, you know, you have to have boundaries to be able to break through them. You know, I'm really loving what I'm doing here at Google in terms of when Google really, I, you know, looked at it as the challenge was, because clearly Google was very successful in, in software and browser. But when they really, three years ago, made the commitment to go into hardware, physical product in a fully expressed way. I mean, they had done Chromebooks before and had done some reference models, but really to create a hardware line in many different areas and stay with it, they kind of looked around and said, wait a minute, you understand how to do that. And so (laughs) it was incredible to, with the team, think about when you hold Google in your hands, you know, what are you going to want to feel like? What is the right attributes of Google that we can pull out that we want to the principles that we want to inspire us with? And so, you know, as I said, I always want to do everything once and I had never created a design department and a design aesthetic from scratch in such a large company. You know, usually I stepped into companies that already had this discipline, a well-oiled machine, but this opportunity to within the scale of Google and the brand that had developed to be able to, the gift of being able to define what that should look and feel like and how we should create together has been an amazing gift. So you, um, were you already working for Google before you started putting together the hardware department? About five years ago, they had called me to come in and be head of Google Glass after they had already launched the first edition of Glass and they wanted to work on the second edition. And I remember, you know, I got this note saying you came highly recommended and I thought, wow, why me? And I had forgotten that, I guess when I stand back and look at it through their eyes, um, having been designing product. I was also, I forgot to talk about somewhere along the journey, I was chief marketing officer for the gap and for art.com because people that had seen me in operation would say, cause I, I'm a whole systems thinker. I can't think of the part without the context of the whole. So whenever I would lead the team 
to design products, we would serve up how we might serve it to the consumer in the spirit in which it was created. So one of my ex-bosses said, you would be fantastic being a chief marketing officer. And so I thought, sure, I'll try it. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But so I had been in marketing, I had been in product design, I was known for innovation, and oh, I forgot, I designed eyewear for eight years. So they said, you're perfect. 18 interviews later, I got the job. It was great because it was through Google X. And even though it ended up that the second edition we all recommended go to enterprise because it wasn't yet ready for real people. It was an incredible uh, learning experience and it allowed me to be here when the company decided to go into other hardware. I want to move into a space for being because you've just returned from Milan and Salone del Mobile is the annual design fair, Milan Design Week. And it is a place where uh, brands come from all over the globe to showcase their furniture and product design. There's a lot of collaboration. So I want to hear a little bit more about this um, interactive installation that Google created in Milan. Can you talk a little bit about this project? Because it's really interesting. Yeah. And I have to say, we just came back Sunday night and it went beyond my greatest dreams because we had, you know, 50 different publications did stories on it. We had lines from an hour to three hours, which of course it made me so sad that people had to wait to have the experience. But the good news is, as people came out of the exhibition, people online would say, is it worth the wait? Is it worth the wait? And they would say yes. And that was like, oh, cool. But, you know, thinking about we launched at a Salone last year, the first time hard Google hardware showed up. Um, it was a great opportunity. Marketing had known that I had always take my teams to Salone because I think it's just a place of inspiration, no matter what commodity you're in, to just see materials and the best firms and designers show there. And we had la- we had shown up last year, kind of our first time, with a very beautiful small exhibition that was showing the spirit in which we created our design language, which was, you know, human and optimistic and bold. And that went really well. People appreciated it. And so I thought, how am I going to, how are we going to outdo that this year? And Mudo, the furniture company had contacted us because they loved our aesthetic and we've always admired their aesthetic. And we had kind of talked about doing some project together, but I didn't just want to put our hardware in their room settings that wasn't unique enough and experiential enough. So I got this flash that, you know, I have been part of the Arts and Mind Lab at Johns Hopkins. I'd gotten a call two years ago. They are studying something called neuroaesthetics, which is really, when I first heard it, I was like, wow, I love those two words separately, neuroscience and aesthetics, but what do they mean put together? And it's really the fact that now neuroscience can prove the effects that aesthetics have on our body. And aesthetics is not just making something look pretty. It is really alivening our senses. It is what I think makes us feel alive and brings us joy. And I do believe that we have flatlined a bit as a society. We have forgotten how important all of these things that make us feel alive, you know, art, music, dance, um, smell, sound. I mean, we all of that. Um, has got to be part of our being again. And so... Yeah, somehow we deprioritize that, and it sucks. It does does suck. (laughs) No, I think, you know, I've done some research on it, and when we started getting into our ego and our frontal lobe, you know, we got into the rational mind and all of these other things, which was really celebrated in ancient times, kind of got deemed irrational, and so mm-hmm. the rational mind, be, and now we're, you know, in a, in a place where we're trying to optimize the rational mind. And I also think we're in a place where we have some depression happening and we're not healthy as a society. And I do believe yeah. that part of it comes from not giving us the joy of igniting aesthetic senses. And so I've been fascinated with this work. And I had this idea that, wow, could we give people... You know, if, the gift I would love to give at Salone is giving people the experience of reflecting a bit that our body, because we've been living so much in our head, and that our, our body is sensing things all the time, and that sometimes, you know, our body is feeling all the time, and that this idea that everything we surround ourselves with 
you know, colors, textures, scents, smells actually has an effect on our body and our well-being and that we have agency over this and we just need to understand it. And so we, I kind of had this vision of, you know, could we create rooms that are different from a sensorial point of view with lighting and sound and textures and colors and music and create a band that has sensors that people would wear and they should spend uh, five minutes in each room just doing nothing, <laughs> just being in that space. And that's why it's called space for being. And then could we give people the gift of looking at the data to show them at which room in which environment was their body the most at ease or peaceful in, which might be different than their mind walking into a room and saying, I love this space. Mm. And so this was a great collaboration between, I called Susan at the Arts and Mind Lab and said, could Johns Hopkins work with us and really help us create an algorithm? And this was being done just for this exhibition, um, an algorithm that could take these four sensors and help to suggest at which in which space was your body most at ease. And then I contacted um, my friend Suchi Reddy at Ready Made, who's a great architecture firm in New York, who really specializes in, in form through feeling. And I said, I would love for you to design the spaces because everything matters, the curve of the ceiling, the angles of the wall. And so it was really a collaboration between Google and my design team and our advanced technology team here, as well as uh, Suchi Reddy, who did the architecture, and Susan Magnuson from the Arts and Mind Lab at Johns Hopkins, and Mudo, the furniture company. It was a lot of work. I mean, it was a vision and a dream, and it was like constructing um, three different houses in five days in Milan. I was so excited. Oh, and also it was very important that the data – that we present that to people in a, in a, cause we have to walk our talk, right. In a aste mm -hmm. aesthetic way, not graphs and numbers. So my internal group came up with a great way working with an outside resource to actually the data becomes this beautiful, almost watercolor circle with different colors and gestures, depending on how your body was feeling. So people would be in the offboarding area, when they would take the band off, they each got their own little private space to look at the data, but served up in these beautiful watercolor circles. And then we printed for them the circle in which their body was the most at ease, the room, uh, the circle that represented the room where their body felt the most comfortable. And it was like people looking in a mirror about, they could look at the circle and going, oh, I remember when I walked over and felt the wall at that point. Look, it shows on the circle. So it's not meant to, you know, some, some of the press was saying, well, you know, are you going to make this band? Are people going to walk around? Where I said, absolutely not. I don't see a world where people have to wear a band to tell them what their body is responding to. This is really a way to just let people know that everything matters and that sometimes, and that thoughtful design or being uh, thoughtful around what you surround yourself with can aid in putting you in uh, states that are more stressed or less stressed or more at ease. And so it was really also a way to bring to life what I believe we do at the Google Design Studio, which is we don't wear bands when we're designing because as designers, mm -hmm. we know intuitively that this stuff matters. Um, but we're very thoughtful about thinking not only what does the product do, but how does it feel? And that was really uh, the message. And I was thrilled to see the response that we got. And people really loved the experience and they were thankful for the gift of just insight and where they take it, we shall see. Yes. And I've read a few of the pieces. I think this is such a fascinating installation. I've read a few of the pieces where they were surprised to see that the space that they responded to the most aesthetically, like this is what I would want in my house, was not the space that they felt most at ease in. So there was a disconnect sometimes between their uh, biological, physiological response and their sort of mental judgment of the space, which I think is super interesting because what a better way to like reflect on yourself. Oh, for sure. I mean, I would have been really bummed if everyone, you know, th that was a match. And I'd say half the people, it was a match and the other half were totally surprised. 
And then when we explained what at ease means in that, you know, you could walk into a room and be stimulated and excited and you like it, but that doesn't mean your body is at rest in that place. And so um, we were hoping for that. I would have been, you know, really disappointed had we gotten, a, you know, everyone, you know, seeing the same thing because then it would be, well, okay, I thought so. Um, so actually mm -hmm. it was more interesting to have conversations with the people who had that um, disconnect because of the awareness. Is there any plan for this installation to live on or travel? No, you know, we've gotten so many requests. It is not easy to recreate. And I do believe that's, that was a moment in time. It was, you know, like I, I said earlier, I'm, I'm on to the next thing already. In fact, I'm trying, okay. it was about, it was funny. Uh, we were right in the middle of this insane, you know, seven days, things are going incredibly well. There's lines around the block, and one of someone looked at me and goes, "Oh my God, you're thinking of next year already." I said, "How do you know that?" He said, well, I, could, <laughs> "I could see the way your brain works. Your antennas are going out into the ethers to go, what you know, what do we need to do next?" And she was absolutely <laughs> right. I mean, it was absolutely right that I was already starting to think, "Okay, been there, done this. What's next?" So um, I have an idea. So stay tuned. Ooh, we will. So speaking of that, I mean. I want to talk a little bit about you personally. You've already talked about your creative process and that you've done a lot of learning around like sound vi vibration and color and light and biogeometry. And this whole, you know, foray into neuroaesthetics is super fascinating. And you also have this, your intuitive antennas are always pointed into the future and you got your ego out of the way in your 20s. I want, I'm drawing this all into the idea of resistance and flow. That's something I've been thinking a lot about lately. And I wonder if you can talk about how those dynamics are at work in your life. The way you talk, you talk like you're coming from a quantum perspective versus a Newtonian sort of either or idea. And Okay, you are so perceptive. Yeah, I am definitely a quantum person in terms of I believe in the quantum field because I act on my intuition. I, I image, I feel into what I want to happen and like, you know, feel the feeling of that, what that exhibition would feel like. And I feel like then everything, all the energy attracted and we did it together. And it wasn't just me. It took a village. I believe like I'm never in, I'm always sensing what, is happening. And I do believe that things are happening, you know, past, present, and future. And, and I do believe that the quantum field is full of possibility. That's what makes it fun for me mm -hmm. is, is that knowing that everything is possible and it's, you know, I pay attention to what gets my attention and I go into flow with it and let it take me there. Well, those are words of wisdom for the rest of us. Thank you so much. <laughs> you are welcome. This was fun. More to come. Hey, thank you for listening. To see images of Ivy's work and read the show notes, click the link in the details of this episode on your podcast app or go to cleverpodcast.com where you can also sign up for our newsletter. Please subscribe to Clever, if you haven't already, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you would do us a favor, please rate and review Clever. It really does help people find the show. We also love to chat with you on social media, so follow us at Clever Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Clever is created, produced, and hosted by us, Amy Devers and Jamie Derringer, also known as 2VDE Media with editing by Rich Straffolino and music by L1011. Clever is proudly distributed by Design Milk.